China, the sleeping giant that awakens. A country of 1.4 billion people, of sprawling cities, of a massive economy, the most extensive road network in the world, and the world's largest car industry. Welcome everyone to episode 39 of the Automotive History series. And in this three-part episode, it's about the history of the Chinese car industry. An auto industry too big to ignore. And this is part three. Total world dominance. After almost an entire century of wars, planned economies and communistic malaise, things were finally looking up in the 1990s. China slowly opened up and foreign car makers made deals with Chinese car companies through joint ventures to make cars. One of the most notable is that of Volkswagen and Sayak, who produced the Santana, arguably China's very first real mass-produced car. From here on out, the industry experienced rapid growth. Throughout the 2000s, the industry grew with a whopping 21% per year, and by 2014, China became the world's largest automaker. What would be next? Total world dominance? Before we get to that, let's have a look at the Chinese car industry at the start of the 2010s. Around this time, the Chinese government looked at the country's industry and agreed that, hmm, yeah, things were going great. The pillar industry plan of the 1990s had done its work, and now it's time to guide the flourishing car industry into the next 20 years with another plan called Made in China 2025. This plan is destined to upgrade the current industry into high-tech industry. Think of the development of spacecraft, biotech, and also electric vehicles. And that last thing is what I want to talk about. While the Western world at the start of the 2010s was still half asleep or otherwise making gay jokes about people that drove hybrid cars like the Toyota Prius, China already realized that the next generation of cars should be electric. An electric car is fairly easy to make and reduces massive ecological footprint, two things China could get behind. And while we gawked and drooled over a technical masterpiece called the Tesla Model S in 2012, around the same time the Chinese government started to massively subsidize and encourage the development and production of NEVs, or new electric vehicles, and currently reaps the benefits of this strategy. So, the development of electric vehicles slowly started right next to the production of regular petrol cars. But whereas almost every Chinaman rode a bike made from chopsticks in the 1990s, he now owns a car. Currently, the Chinese car market is slowly becoming saturated, despite the ever-present astonishing annual growth. Almost everyone has a car, and the Chinese car companies know this, and are actively looking for export markets. They are looking at the rest of the world. But back to the Western world. We as Westerners do not hear a lot from China, other than bad news. To completely disregard what is currently going on in China is foolish. But Ed Sauter Reviews is about cars, not politics. That being said, the reason we don't hear a lot about China's car industry and its current developments I just told you about is mostly because of press coverage. I am from Western Europe, and I get lots of car news from European car makers. Plenty of news from Japanese and Korean brands, every so often from the United States, and rarely from the rest of the world like Africa, South America, and Australia. And only from Antarctica if a penguin decides to build a car, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. This leads to a bunch of people screaming over the last 15 to 20 years, The Chinese are coming! The Chinese are coming! China! China! China. China, 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 China. And there is a bunch of people that like to scream, I'll never buy Chinese. But most of them fail to realize that A, some Chinese car makers have already arrived, and B, most of your stuff you use every day are imported, manufactured, or assembled in China. But the Chinese never came. Or is it? 
In the past, some Chinese car makers tried to bluntly enter the very difficult European car market by going full force into it. I have talked about this before, but a Dutch entrepreneur managed to import land wind, and sure enough, the car was off to a great success. It was value for money. It undercut the competition. Low price, lot of car, if it wasn't for a crash test conducted by a German road agency. The car received horrible safety ratings, and the damage was done. And that's pretty much the general view we Westerners have of Chinese cars, or really anything that comes from China. It's cheap, but for all the wrong reasons. It's unsafe, and not made to last long. However, as I explained earlier, the Chinese auto industry has made great steps in the last couple of years in terms of quality and safety, and are full of confidence to try it again. No, I'm not some government shill who tries to trick you into buying a Chinese car, but I'm just genuinely cur- oh. The Chinese car industry is and has always been world-class leading in innovation, design and originality. China number one, China number one. Whew. I do believe my social credit score has gone up with a couple points. Anyway, as I said, the Chinese are eager to try it again, and this time with a new trick up their sleeve, electric vehicles. See, when it comes to EVs, all players are equal. Almost every car company, whether Chinese or Western, has to start from scratch. And although we try to perfect the petrol engine for over 100 years, we lag behind when it comes to electric vehicles. China, not so much, partly thanks to the massive subsidies at the start of the 2010s. With their everlasting efficiency and perseverance, the Chinese are at the same level of development of EVs as the Western world, if not already surpassed it. They are quickly becoming world-leading in the development of EVs, ready to take over the world by selling low-priced EVs and make great use of the increasing demand and the death of the regular petrol car through Western government regulations. Why even bother making a petrol engine when a maintenance-free electric engine is all you need? That's the new strategy. Don't believe me? It's my endless curiosity for the strange and obscure that brought you this three-part episode. And who knows, this part might turn out more relevant than ever in the coming decade. Anyway, let's see how far the Chinese currently are in trying to sell cars outside of China, and it goes more unnoticed than you think. Instead of a full-blown fanfare announcement that they're back, they now try a soft and silent approach to test the waters, especially here in Western Europe. And electric cars are key element here. It really is a scale ranging from that is Chinese to is that Chinese to that's not Chinese. Well, in fact, it is. Let's have a look around today's car market, and I'm going to use Western Europe as an example. Let's start with the cars that are obviously Chinese. If you are a proud man with a van, then why don't you try and prepare yourself for an electric future by buying a Maxus delivery van? The fully electric Maxus is part of SIAC, China's largest car maker. For our buyers with a smaller purse, why not give a shot at owning an electric Cirrus 3 that is from America? At least it's produced and developed over there, but underneath it's nothing more than a rebatched Dongfang Fengong E3. Dongfang also sells cars in some countries under the DFSK name, and these are mostly regular petrol versions. Another newcomer that rapidly developed and set up shop is iWays. And if you'd like to know more about it, I have a review of the car waiting for you. Another startup that promises a lot and still delivers nothing is NIO. And I can't wait to get behind the wheel of the Tesla of China, Xpeng Motors, with a very promising Xpeng P7. And then there are companies like FA, First Auto Works, that want to enter Europe with the honky EHS9, a Rolls-Royce Cullingham look-alike. And it comes from the same honky brand that also makes the flagship of China, the L5. Great Wall Motors will try to conquer the European heart with their funky Way and Aura brand. Especially Aura will come with plenty of feline vehicles, like the Aura Good Cat, and the even crazier Aura Punk Cat. A rip-off uh, reference to the original Volkswagen Beetle. All fully electric, of course, with very promising ranges. There are plenty of others out there, but let's go to the more subtle ones.
To get a foothold in Europe and some recent failed attempts as a fresh memory, companies like Syac saw an opportunity by buying failing European brands and relaunched them with new models, based on existing Chinese car models. For instance, Syac bought failing British Rover and turned it into the Chinese Rowway. That's how the Chinese pronounce the brand. Syac also bought another failing British car brand, MG, known for making fun little sports cars. But their current lineup is anything but sporty. They are electric crossovers. Many would scream blasphemy, but I hope you can understand Syac's move. The electric crossover is currently the hottest type of car for the average consumer, and the MG ZS became a modest hit. Once again, value for money, low price, nice car. MG is expanding their lineup, but they are all rebatched cars coming from China. The first European electric station wagon is in fact a Rowway i5, and the upcoming MG Marvel X is a rebatched Rowway Marvel X. It's not science, guys. And then there is Geely, who bought some failing Swedish brand called Volvo. Volvos are nice cars with that quintessential, understated, sensible Swedish design. Or is it drawn by Chinese designers instead? Don't be shocked if I say that Volvo, its new electric sub-brand Polestar, and this new company called Lincoln Co. are effectively the same. They share many components and designs and are all from Chinese origin, thanks to Geely. Now I could keep going on with this list, but let's move on. Chinese vehicles are already all around us, you just have to look for it. My city, for instance, uses electric city buses that are imported by eBusco, but are entirely Chinese. And the city's streets and sanitation department uses small electric Dongfang trucks. I don't understand what the fuss is about when starting a new electric car brand. Tesla, as well as other Western startup brands, have the hardest time making a prototype, let alone building an entire company around it. In China, it's no problem, however. You can have an idea today and have a fully operational car company tomorrow. You just need a lot of money. Here is how you pull it off. When it comes to the battery and the electric motor, you can just buy that from Tesla. That's no problem. For the design of the car body and the interior, just offer a designer over at the German luxury brand double his current salary and he will come. With a bit of luck, you started out as a high-tech software startup so you can develop the infotainment, engine software and other car management systems in-house, which cuts down cost. And the rest of the car, like the chassis, suspension and brakes, you can order online at AliExpress and receive it in about two days. And you're done. Here is your electric car. What I just described is not a joke. Companies like iWaze did not exist before 2017, and yet here we are five years later and they already operate outside China and made deals with local European dealer holdings. And that is what is currently going on in China. Car companies are popping up everywhere. Either the established big boys convert to making EVs based on their experience with making cars, or there are small startups that make EVs based on their experience with electric technology or software. But many of these startups will eventually run out of manpower or money and either close up shop or get bought out by the big boys. The market is subject to consolidation, much like the Western car industry in the early 1900s. History repeats itself. So, let's get back to that final everlasting question. Could it be true? Has our time come? Will we be buying Chinese in the future? My guess? Most likely, yes. This is only the beginning, and some experts already warned Western car companies that they really need to step up their game or they are going to lose market share. And you'll probably think, well, that's not gonna happen. Well, imagine this. Those who are born today will grow up and buy a car in a decade where Chinese cars are no longer associated with being unsafe and of subpar quality. Most young people these days do not care what badge is glued onto the hood, and some Chinese car companies make great use of that, like Lincoln Co. Lincoln Co. does not sell cars. Lincoln Co. provides mobility through new constructions like memberships. You do not go to a dealership, you go to a clubhouse where you can meet fellow members, look at new cars, drink some coffee, 
and buy merch. And I can tell because I visited one of their locations. It's another subtle way to get young people to buy or own a car, preferably Chinese, by offering a hassle-free experience, like a membership. And even if it does turn out that the United States and Western Europe is a tough nut to crack for the Chinese, then they are currently also invading the rest of the world, mainly developing and third world countries. These countries are largely ignored by European car makers, but the Chinese are more than ready to offer nice, low-priced cars with dubious quality and safety standards, considering the lax regulations in those countries. And once the people over there are hooked, they are hooked. Let me end this three-part episode with a daunting quote I've heard before. It has been said that what the Japanese did in 30 years, the Koreans managed to do in 20 years, and the Chinese will do in 10. Thank you for watching.